Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing adrenoreceptors. Right, so we are currently in the process of discussing the alpha-1 adrenoreceptors and we now want to see how it is that the alpha-1 adrenoreceptors trigger contraction of smooth muscle cell for that is their major location. Their major location is the membranes of smooth muscle cells, okay? Uh, so we want to see how stimulating these alpha-1 adrenoreceptors on the surface of smooth muscle cells triggers the contraction of that smooth muscle muscle cell, okay? And uh, we have seen that to make a smooth muscle cell contract, what you need to do is phosphorylate the regulatory myosin light chain. Okay, so that's what we're going to uh, look at. How does uh, activation of the alpha-1 adrenoreceptor lead to uh, phosphorylation of the myosin light chain, specifically the regulatory myosin light chain? Okay, right. So, Let's start off with our G-protein coupled receptor. So here is the alpha-1 adrenoreceptor, and it's a G-protein coupled receptor, so it has these seven membrane-spanning alpha helices, with the amino terminus extracellularly and the carboxylic acid terminus intracellularly. Okay, now, um, the alpha-1 adrenoreceptor, once it has been activated by its ligand, so let's put in ligand here, so maybe noradrenaline or adrenaline, uh, what will happen is it will change conformation, and this change in conformation will occur on these three intracellular loops here, the intracellular loop 1, the intracellular loop 2, and the intracellular loop 3, and it will now be able to interact with a heterotrimeric G protein and activate that heterotrimeric G protein. Now, which heterotrimeric G protein do the alpha-1 adrenoreceptors interact with? Well, basically, they interact with a GQ heterotrimeric G protein. Now, remember, the way that you name heterotrimeric G proteins is uh, by which alpha subunit they have. So what this is telling us is that this alpha subunit is specifically the G alpha Q, which we discussed some time ago now. So remember, if I can find the piece of paper, um, here is our discussion of the alpha subunits. Okay, so one of the members of the G alpha Q slash eleven family is this G. Excuse me, is this G alpha Q mem uh, gene here? So basically, uh, we are going to interact with a heterotrimeric G protein, uh, which has the G alpha Q subunit as its alpha subunit. Okay, so I'll colour this in in red here. Right. And we don't know what the beta and the gamma subunits are going to be. And for the basis of this pathway, we don't really care what they're going to be. Okay, so I will put the beta gamma subunit here, but we're not going to really worry about what they actually are. Okay, so we've got a beta subunit here and a gamma subunit here as well. Um, so I'll colour in beta in blue, and we'll have gamma in green as well. Okay, now at present, the heterotrimeric GQ uh, G protein is in the off state, okay? So the alpha subunit has guanosine diphosphate bound to it. After this interacts with the uh, activated alpha-1 adrenoreceptor here, what will happen is you will end up with the two separate subunits, okay? So you'll end up with a free beta gamma subunit and also the alpha uh, Q now has a GTP bound to it. Okay, so here is our alpha Q subunit, which has this activated, which is now in the on state, and therefore has GTP bound to it. Okay, uh, now, oops, I should have drawn those separate from one another. Okay, so the beta gamma subunit should be separate from the alpha Q subunit. I'm sorry about that. I'll draw a big line in between them. Okay, so they are now separated from one another. Okay, so they're just floating around in the membrane. Okay, now, this will be happening all over the place, basically. Wherever you're getting the activation of these alpha-1 adrenoreceptors, they will be finding heterotrimeric GQ, G proteins, which just mean heterotrimeric G proteins, where the alpha subunit is an alpha Q subunit, and they will be activating them to produce separate beta-gamma complexes, and then the alpha Q subunit now with GTP bound to it, rather than GDP bound to it, okay? Right, uh, so 
The alpha-1 adrenoreceptor is specific for which heterotrimeric G protein it interacts with. It wants to bind to a specific alpha subunit, and this is the alpha-Q, so it can't just interact with an alpha-S alpha subunit, for instance. And that's a running theme for G protein couple receptors, that they are specific to certain alpha subunits, and they'll only bind to heterotrimeric G proteins, which have certain alpha subunits. Okay, right. So, we are going to concentrate on this alpha Q GTP um, protein here. Okay, so what does the alpha Q GTP protein activate? Well, basically, one of its targets is an enzyme which is within the phospholipid bi there. Okay, and this enzyme is phospholipase C. And specifically, it's phospholipase C of the beta type, so PLC beta. So PLC beta is short for phospho, that's the P. Then the L is a lipase. And then it's C, so phospholipase C, and it's a beta form of phospholipase C. So alpha QGTP will bind to this beta form of phospholipase C and uh, activate it. Now, what is the target of phospholipase C beta? Well, basically, the substrate of this enzyme is within the phospholipid bi there. Okay, and it's a molecule known as phosphatidyl inositol. 4,5-bisphosphate, okay? And phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate is often just abbreviated to PIP2, okay? So, this is a normal component of the phospholipid bi there. You have it within your uh, cell membranes, basically. It's a normal component, and it's usually abbreviated to PIP2. The first P is for phosphatidyl here, the I is then for inositol, the second P is then for phosphate, and then the subscript 2 is to imply that you've got two phosphate groups stuck off this. Right, so what I want to do is to show you a cartoon of the structure of this molecule to try and convince you that it is uh, just a modified version of a normal old boring old phospholipid. Okay, so I want to show you the structure of a normal old boring old phospholipid and then I want to modify it into this modified phospholipid which is phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Okay, right. So, basically, the structure of a normal old boring old phospholipid looks something like this, okay? So we have, at the center, this horizontal line, which I've now colored in in green, which is meant to represent the glycerol molecule, okay? So this horizontal green line represents a glycerol molecule, and the uh, chemist's name for glycerol is propane-123 trial. And although propane-123 trial might be a bit of a mouthful, it's a useful name for uh, this molecule because it tells you exactly what the structure of this actually is. It tells you that we're dealing with a free carbon molecule where you have alcohol groups coming off the first, the second, and the third carbon. Okay, so it's a free carbon molecule where each of the carbons has an alcohol group coming off, and then you saturate all other bonds with hydrogens. Okay, then off the glycerol molecule, in orange, we have these two vertical lines here. And these, basically, are what a biochemist would call fatty acids, but what a chemist would call long-chain carboxylic acids. So fatty acids is the old name for long-chain carboxylic acids. So these are just carboxylic acids which have a really long tail, basically, uh, which is usually very hydrophobic. So long-chain carboxylic acids, okay? And these long-chain carboxylic acids, the carboxylic acid group is a stirified to alcohol groups on the glycerol molecule. So you have this first long-chain carboxylic acid, which is a stirified to the first alcohol group of the glycerol molecule. Then the second long-chain carboxylic acid, which is a stirified to the second alcohol group of this glycerol molecule. Okay, so overall you've got these two long hydrophobic tails then, dangling into the hydrophobic core of the phospholipid bi there, and that's what anchors this molecule in the plasma membrane. Okay, and then what you have is a phosphate group over here. Okay, 
So the, in pink, this little ball here, this represents a phosphate group. And this is why this is called a phospholipid, because we've got uh, the lipid component here, and then we've got a phosphate group. Okay, and um, basically, this phosphate group is linked to the third alcohol group of the glycerol molecule by what's known as a phosphoester link. Now, let me just explain this in a little bit more detail. So, let me show you the structure of a phosphate group. So a phosphate group consists of a phosphorus atom right at the centre uh, with a double bond to an oxygen with two alcohol groups coming off and then a single bond to another oxygen. And you'll notice that this oxygen, it doesn't have enough bonds, okay? It needs, oxygen needs two bonds. So it acquires another electron via ionic means. So it forms an ionic bond effectively and therefore has a negative charge there. Okay, and that takes it up to eight outer shell electrons. So this is the structure of a phosphate group, and it's abbreviated to H2PO4. Uh, so you've got a phosphorus atom at the centre, four oxygen atoms, and two hydrogen atoms, and then it's got negative charge. So H2PO4. Right, uh, so what I want you to look at is look at this structure here just this bit, the phosphorus atom with the double bond to an oxygen and then an alcohol group coming off. Imagine for a moment that that isn't a phosphorus atom but is instead a carbon atom. Ignore the fact that it's got five bonds coming off, which makes no sense if it's a carbon. Uh, but um, just look at this bit that I've highlighted in red. If that's a carbon, what is that? That's a carboxylic acid group that you've got there. We know that carboxylic acid groups can interact with alcohol groups via ester links. Okay, so in fact, phosphate groups uh, are very similar in structure to carboxylic acid groups and can interact with alcohol groups in a similar way. So if I put an alcohol group here, which we can imagine is the alcohol group of the glycerol molecule, if this was a carboxylic acid group, what you could do and what you can do for this phosphate group equally as well, is you could take the alcohol group off the carboxylic acid group, take the hydrogen off the alcohol group of the alcohol molecule, and then bind the carbon of the carboxylic acid here to the oxygen of the alcohol group, okay? And that's what's called an ester link. Now, because this is a phosphorus atom, not a carbon atom, so we have to remember that at the end, this link isn't called an ester link, but it's called a phosphoester link. But the principle of how this reaction occurs is exactly the same as if that was really a carboxylic acid group rather than a phosphate group. So basically, I can react uh, a phosphate group with the third alcohol group of a glycerol molecule uh, to create this phosphoester link between the phosphate group and the glycerol molecule, and that creates me this phospholipid structure here. So this is what you would call a normal old boring old phospholipid. Okay, right. And the official name for a molecule of this type is to call it a phosphatidate molecule. Okay, and is that going to fit in? No. Phosphatidate molecule. Okay, and this is where this phosphatidyl here comes from because what we are going to do is basically take a phosphatidate molecule like this and we're going to link it to inositol and then we're going to link a few phosphate groups off the inositol. So basically we are going to make a modified phospholipid um, and that's what PIP2 is. So basically, what you will notice about this phosphate group is even once it's been linked via a phosphoester link to an alcohol group, such as the alcohol group of glycerol, it still has another one of these carboxylic acid group-like structures here, because we've still got an alcohol group over here, we've still got the double bond to an oxygen, so this is effectively another one of these carboxylic acid groups. So it can actually form another phosphoester link to another alcohol group, and this is in fact what we're going to do. So we're going to take phosphatidate and we're going to modify it to make phosphatidyl and inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. And the first thing we're going to do is stick on an inositol molecule via a phosphoester link uh, to that phosphate group of the phosphatidate molecule. So I will highlight this hexagon here in blue, and this represents an inositol ring. Okay. Now, inositol, um, its proper name 
is its chemist's name. Since I've given everything else its chemist's name, I should give this its chemist's name as well. Its proper chemist's name is, and I'm not going to have room here, is cyclohexane, which I haven't got room for. Cyclohexane, and then it's one, two, three, four, five, six hexol. Okay, so it is a six carbon ring where all of the bonds between the carbons in the ring are single bonds. And then off all of the carbons, you have an alcohol group, and then to saturate it up, a hydrogen as well. So every carbon in this ring has an alcohol group coming off. That's what the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 hexol is about. And then they, it also has a hydrogen coming off. Now, uh, the astute ones among you will notice that there is something difficult about that, because that means that every single one of these carbons is a chiral centre, okay? And the optical isomerism of this becomes really, really complicated because it's like something you'd see on a maths challenge of some sort, trying to work out how many optical isomers this molecule has. It's actually a problem in group theory, okay? Um, but, um, basically, just to get the point across, if you imagine the six um, carbons being in the plane, so imagine this six-membered ring being in the plane, then the other two bonds that come off each of these carbons, one is going to come out of the page towards us, and the other is going to go into the page away from us. Now, one of those bonds will be to an alcohol group, and one will be to a hydrogen, okay? And there's no switching them around once you've decided which way they're going to be, okay? So if we were making an inositol ring, we could have it so that all of the alcohol groups which come off all six of these carbons go into the page away from us and all of the hydrogens come out of the page towards us. That would mean that all of the alcohol groups were on one side of the ring and all of the hydrogens were on the other side of the ring. Okay, on the other hand, we could mix and match. You know, we could have two alcohol groups coming out towards us and the other four going into the page away from us and there are different orientations. You could have that and it's horrendously complicated Complicated. Overall, it means that there are nine different optical isomers of inositol. Okay, now there is one specific optical isomer of inositol that is used all the time in biology, and it's specifically the isomer that is called myo inositol. So if you uh, see people referring to myo inositol, what that refers to is a specific optical isomer of inositol that is used. Uh, in, uh, that in cells, basically. It's the optical isomer of inositol that is actually used within cells. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, we will call it there for this video, and we'll continue our discussion in the next video.